Hello, beloved. Welcome to Theology Thursday with me, Pastor Will, where we've been talking each week a little bit about what Lutherans believe using Luther's small catechism for our guide. Now, last week we talked about the sacrament of Holy Communion and how we believe in the real presence of Christ's body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine. We also talked about how the power of this sacrament as a means of grace is not found in the bread or the wine, but in the words and promise of Jesus, that these have been given and shed for you. And with that, we actually finished our look at the small catechism. So this week and next, as we approach Pentecost, we'll take a look at a few other matters. Today, I wanted to look at Lutheran worship. And even as I say that, I know that it's hard to define in one short video what Lutheran worship is. It's a huge topic because not all Lutherans worship the same way. Every congregation has to find the style and pattern that is most meaningful for their community. And so some follow a liturgy while others prefer non-liturgical worship. Some enjoy music made by pipe organs and others by praise bands. Some pastors wear vestments and others are more comfortable in suits. And in the last year or so, we have seen increasingly that some worship is in person and sometimes worship is online. And all of these things are okay. What matters most in our worship is authenticity. If our worship is authentic, if it is heartfelt, if it leads to a closeness with God and with each other, then that worship honors God. All the other things are details. Now, for the sake of this video, what I want to dig into is liturgical worship, because I find that when we understand the liturgy, it provides a wonderful connection, not only to God and each other, but also to generations of Christians who have worshipped ahead of us. Now, way back when we started this Theology Thursday series, we talked a little bit about Martin Luther's life and the Reformation movement that he helped begin. We talked about how when it became clear that this movement was starting a new church and not just reforming the Roman Catholic Church, Luther kept many Roman Catholic practices, both because they were meaningful to him and because he didn't want to make his parishioners uncomfortable with drastic changes that threw out everything they were used to. One of the things Luther largely kept intact was the liturgy. The word liturgy comes from the Greek words letos, meaning public, and ergos, meaning work. So liturgy is often described as the work and worship of the people. And a liturgy is just that. It's a pattern of worship that connects us, a format that grounds us in tradition and scripture. On pages 92 and 93 of the Evangelical Lutheran Worship Hymnal, you can find a pattern for worship. A Lutheran liturgical service is divided into four parts. The gathering, in which the Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. The word, in which God speaks to us in scripture reading, preaching, and song. The meal, in which God feeds us with the presence of Jesus Christ, and the sending, in which God blesses us and sends us in mission to the world. Now, if you look at these pages, you'll notice that some parts of the service are bolded, while others are in plain text. The bolded portions are considered central elements of the liturgy. These are the things we consider vital to liturgical worship really being worship. Those vital elements include a greeting in the name of the triune God, the prayer of the day, readings from scripture, a sermon reflecting on those readings, a hymn of the day, prayers of intercession, sharing the peace, collecting an offering, preparing for and sharing communion, and a blessing or benediction. Interestingly, while we at St. Martin's tend to begin every week with confession and absolution or with the thanksgiving for baptism, and while we tend to confess our faith with a creed every week, these elements are not considered vital to liturgical worship. 
Now, the readings that we use follow a particular pattern as well. Many Christian churches, including Lutherans, use the Revised Common Lectionary as a guide for our readings. The Revised Common Lectionary follows a three-year cycle, switching between the Gospels of Matthew in year A, Mark in year B, and Luke in year C. And John's Gospel is used to supplement Mark in year B, as well as to mark festivals and special days in the church year. The first lesson is typically taken from the Hebrew Scriptures, except, for instance, in the season of Easter when it has come from Acts. And the second lesson usually comes from one of the epistles. The psalm, as you might expect, generally comes from the book of Psalms, although there are times when we find another reading to fill that place. Close to Christmas during the season of Advent, we sometimes use the Magnificat of Mary. The three-year cycle of the Revised Common Lectionary follows the church calendar so that the readings are thematically appropriate to the season of the church year. Now, some congregations have begun using a different lectionary called the Narrative Lectionary, and this is structured around following a continuous story rather than jumping all over the place in Scripture. Other congregations don't follow a, uh, a lectionary at all, but choose texts that fit a sermon series or a theme that is appropriate to the congregation. The readings aren't the only parts of the service that connect us with Scripture, though. Some parts of the liturgy are taken directly from the words of the Hebrew and Christian Scriptures. For instance, the hymn of praise declares glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth, which comes from Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Or the verses of this is the feast where we sing blessing and honor and glory and might be to God and the Lamb comes from Revelation 5. The Agnus Day that we sometimes sing as we come for communion, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, comes from the words of John the Baptist in John chapter 1. And while we have different musical settings for these things, ten of them uh, in the ELW alone, and while we sometimes change the words very slightly to match different rhythms, these words have been sung in Christian worship in some form or fashion for centuries. One of the common benedictions that is spoken at the end of worship is called the Aaronic Blessing and comes from Numbers chapter 6 when Aaron is instructed to bless the Israelites, saying, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Other parts of worship, like the offering or the sharing of peace, may not use words from Scripture directly, but they originate in scriptural mandates to give of what we have for the needs of others and to share the peace of Christ with our neighbors. Even the pastor's garments, called vestments, have special meaning. The white robe a pastor wears is called an alb and is meant to be a reminder of our baptismal garments and the purity that we receive through Christ. The stole, which is worn about the shoulders, is a symbol of the pastor's ordination and typically reflects the color of the day in the church calendar. The cincture, the rope belt worn around the waist, symbolizes a willingness to serve and is reminiscent of Jesus' words to Peter in John chapter 21 when he says that one day Peter will have a rope tied about him and he'll be led where he does not wish to go as part of his calling. Now friends, there is certainly so much more that we could say about worship. But that's all the time that we have for today. What's something new that you learned? Or what are questions you still have that I haven't answered? I'd love to hear from you about these things in the comment section. And I hope you'll join me next week as we finish this Theology Thursday series by talking a bit about discipleship. Until then, beloved, may God bless you and keep you. Amen.